ओके सर थैंक यू A very good morning to everyone from CSR and EST Zorhat Assam, India. On behalf of the entire team of IBWGST 2022, I, Nobuzu Timolia, Junior Research Fellow of Geoscience and Technology Division, CSR and EIST, take this opportunity to welcome you all to the sixth day of the third international virtual workshop on global seismology and tectonics. Thank you everyone for joining us today and for showing your continued support and overwhelming response towards this event. We have an announcement for all the research scholars, postdoctors, doctors, graduate students that we would like to encourage all of them for their active participation even towards the end of this lecture sessions. We are happy to announce that we will select three best participants and award them in terms of citation at the end of this workshop. The selection will be done on the basis of three parameters, which will include percentage of attendance, active participation and quality of question raise. So we look forward to your interactive participation throughout this workshop. We are privileged to have with us today Professor Zaya Kyle, ex-Deputy Director General of Geological Survey of India as the session chairperson. Um, now may I request uh, Professor Kyle sir to say a, a few words. Over to Professor Kyle sir. Thank you so much uh, Devjyoti and uh, I'm so glad to on behalf of the ranging committee to welcome Dr. Gandhara I for today's lecture. I know Dr. Rai for a long time since my NGRI, you know, visits since long you know, in the past in early 90s and all. Then I have a very vivid memory of attending an international workshop at the site deep digging site, Karat. It was organized, uh, you know, he was one of the key person to organize this one international workshop. So in my uh, eyes, the dealing site, the logs, the, you know, the little logs, the, the whole laboratory there, the activities there, everything is in my, you know, vivid memory. And today we are lucky to have a little information of the dealing, deep dealing, only deep dealing in India, in the in the shield area. I think this is one of the unique uh, investigations in the world and the first of its kind in India. So anyway, we we'll, we all look forward to listening to Dr. Rai with his, you know, new information to this investigation. So Dr. Rai, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kayal, for your very kind words. Uh, let me share my presentation. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, sir. Uh, yeah. Just before proceeding. Yeah. Uh, yesterday, we witnessed a very enlightening lecture delivered by Professor C.P. Rajendran from NIS Bengaluru on the medieval pulse of earthquakes in the central Himalaya and the future seismic hazard in the region. Now I would like to introduce to our today's keynote lecturer is Honorable Director of Borehole Geophysics Research Laboratory under the Ministry of Art Science, Dr. Sukanta Roy, who will be delivering a talk on the topic, deep drilling and downhole measurements, monitoring to understand earthquake processes. The participants will come to know more about him from Mr. Sandan Day, who is a senior research fellow at CSR NEIST Jorhat. Now may I request Mr. Day to read out an illuminating biodata of Dr. Roy. Over to Mr. Day. Thank you, Nobojiti Modia. Uh, could you please confirm if I'm audible? Yes, you are audible. Yes, thank you. You are audible. Uh, good morning to everyone present with us in this very blessed Sunday. It is an absolute honor for me to introduce Dr. Sukanta Roy, who is presently serving as the director of the Borehole Geophysics Research Laboratory, Karnad. The primary interest, research interest of Dr. Roy include heat flow and radiogenic heat production studies, geothermal studies, uh, geothermics of climate change and scientific drilling investigations in uh, active fault zones. His recent work include the uh, success, successful completion of a three kilometer deep pilot borehole and investigations, which provide new insights into the geothermal and geomechanical regime in the Poina seismogenic zone. Dr. Roy completed his PhD in geophysics in their 1997 from the Banaras Hindu University and then served the geothermal uh, studies program of CSR, NGRI in various capacities. 
He was a member of, of the scientific planning group on size, uh, sustainable energy for the ICSU Regional Office of Asia and the Pacific. Uh, besides co-authoring two books, he has also served as the section editor for the Encyclopedia of Solid Earth Geophysics. He has published more than 100 research papers and conferred editorial role for several journals. Uh, Dr. Roy was awarded the best PhD thesis in geophysics, of course, in 1998, and also the National Mineral Award in 2008. Uh, he has contributed to the International Heat Flow Commission under various roles. Uh, Dr. Roy is a fellow of the Geological Society of India and a and, and member of Indian Geophysical Union Society of uh, and uh, Society of Petroleum Geophysics. He serves the Executive Committee of International Continental Scientific Drilling Program. Of course, that was a very sharply concise bio of Dr. Roy, and I'm very excited to listen to his keynote lecture today, the topic of which is uh, deep drilling and downhole measurements and monitoring to understanding earthquake processes. Thank you. Over to Novajini Molya. Thank you. Uh, now may I request the keynote speaker of today's session, Honorable Director of the BZRL, Dr. Sukhantar Roy, sir, to kindly enlighten us with this lecture. Over to you, sir. So uh, is my slide seen now? Yes, sir. It's busy. Okay, fine. fine. And it's changing also, right? Yes, sir. OK, fine. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much for, again for the introduction. Um, I would like to talk. Uh, in fact, I was asked to talk uh, by Santanu on deep drilling and downhole measurements and monitoring to understand the earthquake processes. And I would uh, uh, really talk on a study that we are currently doing in the Koina seismogenic zone uh, in the western part of India, which is uh, which is an, a well-established area a site for reservoir triggered earthquakes. I would uh, like to, at the outset, acknowledge uh, several mentors and colleagues at the Ministry of Earth Sciences Boral Geophysics Research Laboratory and CSIR NGRI, ICDP, International Continental Scientific Drilling Program, and several others. And I'd particularly like to thank Dr. Deep Jyoti Goswami, my colleague here at BGRL, and uh, Mr. Vyasulu and others, uh, Surajit Misra, a former colleague at BGRL, now at Gauhat University, uh, and others to uh, have contributed in uh, great measure to what I'll be talking today. Uh, scientific drilling investigations in active fault zones, that is what I would be covering. And uh, scientific drilling investigations in active fault zones can contribute to uh, understanding the earthquake processes in several ways, primarily by providing constraints on the deep subsurface conditions from geophysical and seismological data and by providing geological samples from the uh, seismogenic depths uh, to study deformation behavior, rock strength, seismic velocity, permeability, frictional properties, and a whole lot of other uh, parameters that are absolutely essential to understand the earthquake processes. So in my talk today, I would uh, spend a couple of slides on scientific drilling in active fault zones, and then the key science questions and the need for drilling. I'd uh, then uh, talk about Koina, the reservoir triggered seismicity in Koina, uh, and uh, uh, describe the Koina pilot borehole drilling as well as the measurements, downhole measurements, and the results that we have seen so far, and uh, more importantly, future directions. And uh, I'd like to also acknowledge Dr. Salesh Naik, the keynote speaker of the first day, who actually made my job easier by covering a lot of ground. He gave a fine overview of the Koena Scientific Drilling Program. And uh, I would be concentrating on a few results uh, from, uh, uh, from the study that we have got so far. But for the benefit of the students, um, uh, and the young scientists, I would, uh, I have 
I would like to mention a few points uh, why drilling is needed. And at the, if you see the right hand panel, uh, I have noted down a few points there. Geoscientific insight into the deep earth processes uh, currently is mostly based on observations made at the surface some indirect evidence through geophysical investigations or increasingly through modeling. However, several critical earth system processes are difficult to observe from the ground surface only. Hence, despite the great progress achieved in solid earth science during the past decades, truly ground truth knowledge of the dynamics of the earth's crust is limited. And direct access to the interior of the Earth's crust, or at least to a few kilometers depth, is only possible through drilling boreholes and making a suite of uh, various kinds of geological, geophysical uh, measurements at depth. And if you see the uh, uh, cartoon uh, in the center of the slide, so uh, this just reminds us that geological faults are not like the ones shown at the top, but more likely uh, somewhat like shown in the bottom, it's really complex, complicated, several processes acting on it. Uh, of, but often in our studies, we, we show faults as a, as a plane, as a, a straight line depiction on the paper. But really that's not so. So this leak like you to keep in mind. Okay, when we talk about uh, seismology, uh, it's a very, very broad field. And basically what we uh, are trying to do or what globally the people, science seismologists are trying to do is to, is to make advancements from the current empirical models of earthquake initiation and fault slip to a full physics-based understanding of rupture processes. And there are a wide variety of questions, but if you look at the right on the, on the, on the top right panel, you have a uh, uh, spatially, what, what I show there is a spatially averaged stress on the fault uh, varying over geological time. And you can see the tectonic, so it's stress versus geological time. And tectonic stress slowly builds up along the fault, as you can see, uh, slowly builds up along the fault until it reaches the local strength defined by uh, 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 the, the uh, dashed line that you see there. Uh, that critical level. And then uh, an earthquake occurs with a sudden stress drop, which is shown here. And this goes on. A new earthquake cycle subsequently begins. But if you look at the bottom uh, figure, uh, this is a more realistic version of the process. And uh, you can see that it's not a simple process like that as shown in the top panel, uh, top uh, figure, but uh, it's it's very complex. It includes the complications of heterogeneity, uh, very rock heterogeneity, variable strength, loading rate, stress drop, uh, modification of the permeability due to previous earthquake cycle, uh, rock strength, subsurface stress, and uh, so on and so forth. And therefore, what you what you what you get is uh, really uh, very complex and it's and it's uh, extremely important to study these processes these uh, the dependence on these parameters because that will give us a clue to understand the 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 physics of the earthquakes for example the recurrence time and so on and so forth so the broad questions here i'll not go through the, these these are very well known like internal architecture of fault zones is one of the important things and then earthquake occurrences are controlled primarily by the stress levels on a fault and how stresses recover to prepare for the next event that's what i discussed how one earthquake promotes or inhibits another how material properties of a particular fault affect its tendency to fail rather than creep so these there are there are a whole lot of questions which are really of interest and about which we know very little because uh, extremely uh, meager data from the near field uh, are available. And uh, if you see the current literature, uh, uh, excellent papers on laboratory experimentation of to understand the fault dynamics and the frictional processes are underway at various laboratories in the world. And I think those are the uh, key to understanding these uh, these these to to address these questions. 
Okay, so when we talk about earthquake genesis, as, as I discussed uh, a while ago, these parameters, there are several parameters. In addition to studying the uh, seismic seismological records, uh, in order to understand earthquake genesis, you need to know a, a wide range of parameters. For example, the structure and the deformation processes, rock strength, fault frictional strength, subsurface fracture patterns, permeability of the fault zone, chemistry of the fault zone fluids, temperature, stress regime, fluid pressure, etc. And <clears throat> many of these, well, all of these param uh, parameters uh, uh, measuring or constraining all of these parameters requires drilling. Uh, some of these parameters you can measure in situ, for example, uh, the, uh, the temperature, the stress regime, the fluid pressure, uh, uh, subsurface fracture patterns from uh, geophysical logs or the image logs. But many of these parameters you can only study in the laboratory, for example, for, to constrain the fault friction. To, uh, to, to, to measure the permeability. Permeability is again a very tricky thing, but to measure it, the best way available is to do in the laboratory. Rock strength measurements, uh, chemistry of fault zone fluids, etc. So uh, I uh, show this slide. Uh, uh, I, often, I, I, I often use this very sage advice uh, given by one of the all-time greats at the United States Geological Survey, Menlo Park, uh, Arthur Lackenbrock, unfortunately, who is, who is no more. But when I met him uh, once, he mentioned uh, this very sage thing, which I, which I really want to repeat again and again. If you want to know the answers, ask the earth, because the earth is very knowledgeable, but you've got to ask the right questions. And I take this example of Seyford, the San Andreas Fault Observatory at depth, because uh, this is the project which started this discussion about scientific deep drilling and measurements near the uh, in the near field of the earthquakes. Uh, uh, this uh, unique drilling experiment that was carried out in the San Andreas Fault zone. Uh, uh, and you can see the cartoon. And then uh, what was important was that uh, the idea of instrumenting the borehole uh, at depth, creating an observatory at depth, uh, actually came up and now we know that sensors placed in deep holes drilled through an active fault zone can can capture measurable signals well it's a very simple statement but it's a very difficult very challenging proposition but yes it 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 can be done in many cases so with this background uh, i move to the to our own experiment in in the coina seismogenic zone so uh, for uh, I think all of you are, uh, let me see. OK, there are a few uh, guests from outside India. So for those uninitiated to the geology of India, uh, uh, let me uh, show that this is the geological map on the left panel of the slide, the geological map of a broad geological map of India from the uh, Geological Survey of India, uh, simplified from the Geological Survey of India. And if you can see, Koina is located on the west coast of India in the westernmost part of the 65 million year old uh, Deccan Trap province shown in green shading. In, in the next, uh, uh, below this, of course, I show the Koina Dam, uh, the, uh, the artificial water reservoir that was built on the Koina River uh, in this part of the country. And the dam was impounded in 1962 and the dam has a height of about 103 meters and a reservoir volume of um, around 3,000 uh, million cubic meters. In the central uh, uh, figure, this is the uh, this shows the seismicity map of the Koina Warna region. The Koina region, uh, you can see the Koina reservoir on the top, the blue one here there, and the Warna reservoir at the bottom. And the Koina seismogenic zone basically. Uh, extends from the Koina Reservoir in the north down to the Warner Reservoir in the south, covering an area of about 20 kilometers by 30 km, 20 kilometers east-west by 30 kilometers north-south. Uh, and you can see the seismicity uh, plotted on this uh, map. Uh, the, 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 one, of the, one of the unique features is that this seismicity started 
in nine, a few years after the dam was impounded in 1962. The largest earthquake, uh, triggered earthquake, took place in 1967, magnitude 6.3. And uh, a lot of studies have been carried out on Koena uh, from the lifetime work of uh, Dr. Harsh Gupta at the CSIR National Geophysical Research Institute. And uh, you only have to look at his publications to know uh, 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 very great details, detailed work that has been carried out so far. Uh, also, I sh show here, uh, uh, also these earthquakes are unique in the sense that if you, if you go away from this zone, there are very few earthquakes. So it's a very uh, uh, limited area, uh, uh, limited area of 20 by 30 kilometers where the activity is concentrated and the focal depths do not exceed about 10 kilometers and the earthquakes occur in the granitic basement below a kilometer of thick uh, uh, Deccan, Deccan basalt. So this area is covered by Deccan, Deccan traps, but the earthquakes yeah. occur yeah. below the traps. Okay. Uh, what what we show here also is uh, uh, a couple of dashed lines. I think there is some disturbance. Uh, uh, kindly mute. Um, okay, so there is a uh, there are a couple of dashed lines here, which shows the trace of the Donichiwada surface rupture zone, which was associated with the 1967 M magnitude 6.3 earthquake. Uh, uh, the seismic activity also here is modulated by the annual loading and unloading cycles of the reservoirs. And that you can see here on the top uh, top panel, uh, uh, the, the correlation between the changing water levels throughout the year and the frequency of magnitude four and greater earthquakes. This has been studied over a long period of 1967 to 2000 uh, till now, and uh, it seems to be very clearly established. The faulting regime here is uh, uh, essentially strike slip faulting with uh, uh, strike slip and normal faulting environment. And you can see here the northern part Koina uh, appears to be more of strike slip, uh, whereas uh, the Warner region appears to appears to have more of normal faulting. But then uh, they are uh, they they are quite mixed. And uh, these factors actually make this zone 20 by 30 kilometer zone a natural laboratory to study the earthquake mechanics. <clears throat> and this is where we we wanted to do deep drilling and uh, investigate the causes of mechanisms of this triggered earthquakes that have continued uh, for the last more than 55 years. So this is uh, this is also a unique case where you know reservoir triggered earthquakes have been reported at more than 100 sites all over the world, but it's only Koina where they have continued for such a long time. Okay, so a lot of uh, seismological monitoring studies have, have been going on since the 1970s, and here I show a, a few seismic clusters which were published by Dr. Hash Gupta and his colleagues at uh, the National Geophysical Research Institute. And you can see uh, the uh, different clusters of earthquakes were identified. And uh, can, uh, we consider here in our study, this cluster D here shown uh, in the north is very close to the Donachiwara fissure zone. As you can see on the right hand side, uh, the panel, right uh, hand panel, this block D is where we concentrate. And it's uh, the Donachiwara fault actually passes through this. And uh, <clears throat> very detailed studies show that the earthquakes here uh, again are uh, uh, most of the earthquake activity is limited to about eight or nine kilometers depth, definitely less than 10 kilometers of depth here. OK. Now, <clears throat> in the 1967 earthquake produced a surface rupture. And these are one of the few well-documented surface structures in, in the world. What do we know about this surface structure zone? It was mapped by the Geological Survey of India in, in the wake of the 1967 uh, magnitude 6.3 earthquake. And on the, on the left-hand panel, you see these fissures were mapped in very great detail uh, uh, from a place 
Nanel in the north to Kadoli village in the south, uh, passing through Donichiwada and uh, crossing the Koina River. And so today you really cannot see these fissures. These are all uh, hidden, uh, buried uh, because of uh, agriculture, cultivation. Uh, but these fissures uh, were, are extremely important to understand the, uh, the, the seismicity here because if you look at all seismicity records in the last few decades, the seismicity is very well aligned along this trend of the fissure zone, not northeast, south, south this, this trend. And 30 years after, after the uh, 1967 earthquake, uh, 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 a soil gas helium survey was, was carried out by CSIR in GRI. Uh, across these fissures uh, at a place here near Kadoli, and on the central panel, you can see the results of the uh, helium levels, helium-4 levels. Uh, uh, across these fissures, which are shown as the solid black lines here. Uh, these are the fissures in the central part of the figure. And the and what you see in the red, the red curves are basically helium measurements, soil gas helium measurements, uh, um, and analyzed by uh, mass spectrometer. And you can see very clearly that the helium peaks uh, lie are aligned along the fissures. So this was a very clear, uh, st this made a very clear statement that the fissures were still active. These fissures were still open 30 years after the earthquake uh, because helium was escaping and up to levels of up to seven parts per million over an atmospheric background of uh, 5.24 parts per million. So this was one very important study. Uh, uh, which gives us a lot of information. Back. Now, there are several studies that have been carried out, particularly seismological, geophysical, and and, uh, and geological studies, but uh, 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 the, uh, we, we have understood a lot about these earthquakes, but still I think the core scientific issue uh, uh, about what, is the, what are the mechanisms of these earthquakes and how these earthquakes are triggered and how this frequent recurrent seismic activity has been sustained over such a long time has not really been answered. And uh, one reason uh, that we thought we think uh, is that our knowledge about the physical properties of rocks and fluids in the fault zones and how they affect the buildup of stress for extended periods of time is uh, really limited. Uh, because of the lack of data from the near field region. Uh, on the right hand panel, uh, I have listed uh, several key science questions and these questions again, uh, there are many questions which are common to many drilling projects, but particularly the Seford experiment uh, that was carried out in San Andreas. Uh, Questions like how do stress orientation and magnitude vary across fault zones, nature of co-seismic deformation, how does rock strength control recurrent seismicity, what is the thermal structure of the Koina seismogenic zone and its implications for seismogenesis, what is the role of reservoirs, how do earthquakes nucleate and propagate, uh, the earthquake source parameters scale with uh, magnitude and depth, fluid pressure and permeability within and adjacent to fault zones, and many of these questions are really, really important to understand these mechanisms in the near field, but they cannot be done without uh, deep drilling. And in Koina, uh, we have an opportunity to study these by drilling uh, up to about five to seven kilometers of depth, which in, with the present day technology is challenging, but it's doable. So with this uh, background, we, we uh, set out to acquire deep borehole data in the area to know more about the subsurface fault fracture zones and their physical and mechanical properties, the subsurface stress regime, and the study of the fracture orientations, etc. So uh, this is the pilot borehole, which uh, the, the black cross here, which we drilled. The background information was available from these solid, uh, the uh, nine other sets, of, uh, set of nine other boreholes 
which are shown by these solid uh, bl black solid circles surrounding the uh, Koina seismic zone. And these were boreholes which were drilled during 2012 to 2014 and varied from in depth, uh, ranged in depth between about 1000 meters to 1500 meters. And we chose this site for the pilot borehole, for drilling the pilot borehole up to a depth of three kilometers. And the pilot borehole was necessary because uh, it's, it's, it's in line with the international practice. It's always a good idea to do a pilot experiment, uh, to pilot uh, drilling experiment before going for the main uh, borehole up to a depth of five to seven kilometers. So this borehole was also a test bed for our uh, upcoming deeper borehole. Now this borehole passed through uh, uh, 1250 meters thick Deccan basalt, as you can see in the central panel, and went about 1750 meters into the granite gneiss basement. So this is the deepest borehole drilled uh, in the crystalline basement in the country so far. And you can see on the right panel the location of the borehole. So this is the Donachivara fissure zone, and the dashed line. So here is Nanel, here is Kadoli, where these soil gas helium studies were done earlier. And this is the site of the uh, pilot borehole. And as I said, the objectives uh, were mainly to uh, determine the in situ physical and mechanical properties of rocks at seismogenic depth, the delineation of subsurface fault fracture zones and their properties, subsurface stress and temperature regime, and orientation of surface, subsurface faults and fractures and their disposition with respect to the maximum horizontal stress orientation. And none of this information was available before we took up this study. So I'll not go into detail of this again, but just to uh, summarize in one slide, the kind of background information that we had before we took up this deep drilling. So we knew the uh, uh, surface fissures, fractures in the Koina region. We knew the, we knew the distribution of seismicity from a detailed 23 station seismic network that has been operating since 2005. We knew the results from the soil gas helium study, and we knew the results from the exploratory drilling at nine sites. Uh, from which we uh, uh, are now clear about the thickness of the Deccan traps in this region at different sites, the characteristics of the lava flows and the intratrapian red bowls, depth to the basement, nature of the basement, petrological and mineralogical characteristics of the granitic basement rocks, the brittle deformation from petrography and microstructure. And we also had a first cut uranium lead zircon age of the basement rocks, which ranged between 2.5-2.7 GA. And these studies have been done by uh, several several uh, uh, workers, and I'm for shortage of time, I'm not naming all of them right now. But uh, uh, this this has been a really big experiment involving several people from NGRI, from uh, uh, other institutes in the country. So we had uh, uh, some information on the physical properties of the rocks down to 1.5 kilometer depth. We had the rock strength properties subsurface temperature regime. And here we have the uh, general lithologs of the seven of the nine boreholes and you can see on the top parts are the basalt and the ones shown below in pink shading those are the basement rocks and you can see that uh, the basement undulations as Dr. Naik pointed out the other day on 20th uh, in his talk on the 20th that the undulations in the basement were are really small within about 100 meters. And there was no sediment between the uh, the traps and the basement rocks. We had the heat flow. Uh, we had we made temperature measurements up to 1.5 kilometer depth. We made a detailed characterization of the thermal conductivity of the basalts and the granites, and uh, we uh, were able to determine a very very reliable value of robust value of heat flow, and it's about 43 milliwatt per square meter, very consistent with the Dharwar Creton. Uh, adjoining in the south. And from these and uh, measurements of radiogenic heat production uh, in the laboratory, we were able to extend uh, or predict the temperatures up to a depth of 10 kilometers. And uh, we got estimates of temperatures that we would expect uh, if we want to drill up to a depth of five to seven kilometers. So the temperatures would be in the range of 110 to 130 degrees Celsius. So this was a very important piece of information uh, that assisted in uh, in planning the drilling and the downhole measurements. 
Now, go to the pilot borehole. And here, I would quickly uh, like to mention that a healthy borehole is the key to, a sub to successful deep exploration and experimentation. Because the borehole is just the tool for us to do the studies. And if, the, if we have a good stable borehole, then we can do a lot of measurements. But there are very big challenges in drilling such a borehole through the crystalline basement rock here, particularly through the through a zone which has been infested with earthquakes for such a long time. So uh, the challenges were geological and, uh, of course, the rock type, the large depth that we wanted to drill up to three kilometers, the fault fracture zones, mud loss zones, overpressured, potentially overpressured zones. Uh, we did not know whether there would be overpressured zones before the drilling, so we had to take the precautions. We wanted to maintain the verticality to less than about three degrees uh, so that several of the measurements could be completed successfully and the interpretations made. The coring and the sampling of rocks and fluids had to be done. We had to do the full suite of downhole measurements and ultimately, if possible, we would also do borehole instrumentation. So on the right hand panel, you can see the config well configuration of the pilot borehole. So this was drilled in three different stages, zero to 500 meters, 500 to 1500 meters, 1500 to three kilometers. And the different borehole sizes are shown here. So we started with about a one and a half feet diameter, then came down to about a feet in diameter. And then at the end, uh, 1500 to 300, 3000 meters, we drilled with uh, eight and a half inch diameter and accordingly the casing sizes uh, were also calculated and uh, the borehole has been cased basically with steel casing the as you can see on the on the on the right hand panel right hand uh, plot here which shows the borehole inclination from the vertical and you can see except for some small excursions during in the range uh, 1300 to 1500 meters more or less it's well within two to three degrees uh, from the vertical. So, so this was a very good uh, uh, drilling that was done. So here I saw, show uh, the drill site, the drill bits, the rig, and it was a fantastic experiment. Uh, uh, drilled with indigenous expertise and resources. We used a unique hybrid drill rig, so it was not the conventional mud rotary drilling because <clears throat> that would have taken a long, long time to drill through the crystalline basement at such depths and also uh, where you would expect a lot of fractured horizons. So it was a combination of primarily air hammer drilling and uh, mud rotary in certain sections where it was necessary. So this entire drilling took about uh, eight months, six months actually, but another two, three months for mobilization and site preparation, etc. So I show a quick uh, uh, video of the drill site, uh, maybe a few seconds. So you can see the kind of large scale operation that was necessary to drill this three kilometer borehole. Uh, big rig, automated rig, and then mud pumps and the compressors and effluent treatment laboratories, uh, gas laboratory, uh, and, and and everything that you can see here. So it was a really, really big exercise with uh, uh, the each uh, rod length was about nine meters. And you can see uh, almost in the middle of nowhere, we were uh, all uh, working for about eight months during when this drilling was, was in progress. Okay, I'll close this uh, video and move on. Uh, okay, so uh, after the drilling was completed to three kilometers, uh, uh, we carried out, all, uh, in fact, uh, even when the drilling was in progress, we carried out the geophysical logging when the borehole was at a depth of uh, 1500 meters. And then we carried another round of geophysical logging when the borehole was at a depth, of, uh, when the borehole reached its final depth. And you can see the logging uh, Sundays and the team. So we had, uh, we also had a lot of help from Slumbaje uh, in carrying out the geophysical logging. Uh, and uh, so I go to the results now. And 
uh, what I want to concentrate for today's talk is basically the granitic basement rocks because these are the rocks where the uh, these are the host rock for the earthquake activity in the Koina region. Uh, you can see on the right hand panel a snapshot of geophysical logs, various geophysical logs uh, from 1500 meters depth to 3000 meters depth. And you can see the plots of self potential caliper, gamma ray, uh, VP, VS, the P wave velocity, the S wave velocity, the Poisson's ratio, Young's modulus, shear analysis, anisotropy, neutron porosity, density, and at the end, we have the resistivity logs, the electrical resistivity logs. But what's uh, uh, so these these gave us very uh, good estimates, in situ estimates of the different physical parameters uh, of the granitic basement rock. But very importantly, if you look at the zone between 2000 meters to 3000 meters or more uh, specifically 2100 meters to 3000 meters, you will see you can clearly see several zones uh, extending from a few meters to a few tens of meters thick, which had very anomalous physical properties where in such zones, you, you will see that many of these properties behave very anomalously. And you, you can clearly see these. These are shaded uh, for uh, showing uh, for clarity. Uh, we have shaded these zones and numbered them 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 here on the left side. And these anomalous zones, if you see, look carefully, they are all characterized by low electrical res resistivity, low density, high porosity, low VPVS, high Poisson's ratio, low Young's modulus. And these zones uh, gave us the first idea that, OK, we were going through really uh, anomalous physical property zones. And these could be uh, you know, fault zones or fracture zones and could have a bearing on the uh, seismicity in this region. But we will we'll, we'll deal with these zones in the next uh, several slides in uh, looking at them more carefully using different parameters. So I'd show another uh, snapshot of the physical and elastic properties of the basement granitoids again. And you can see here, uh, again, we have shaded those seven uh, zones with gray shading. And if you look at carefully um, three, particularly three logs, the porosity log, the VPVS log and the Poisson's ratio log you can see very high values in all these anomalous zones. And high VPVS, high neutron porosity and high Poisson's ratio may imply the presence of water or saturated rock in the fracture zones. And the evidence of water bearing fracture zones below, all of them you can see below 2100 meters, indicate that deep percolation might be happening up to such depths. And again, that's a very interesting observation, which we uh, also confirmed from uh, thin section studies on core samples and uh, cutting samples obtained from the borehole. OK, we also had a, a very good cross dipole sonic log, which allowed us to study the anisotropy in much more detail than otherwise is possible. And we had the, uh, I'll not go into details of this, uh, but I'll show the results. So on the left hand panel, you can see the VPVS uh, uh, plots with depth in the basement rock from 2000 meter to 3000 meter, because that's the zone where we are particularly interested in view of those anomalous uh, physical and mechanical property zones. And on the uh, here, we have also calculated the uh, shear anisotropy shown as percentage. So it's basically the fast and this the difference between the fast and the slow uh, uh, shear waves uh, divided by fast multiplied by 100. So that gives that gives the percentage and the shear wave anisotropy, as you can see in overall, it ranges about one to four percent. But in these anomalous zones, one to seven, they can go as high as up to 25 percent in some cases. So. Uh, to examine the, the, the nature of anisotropy in the formation, we carried out the dispersion analysis, uh, dispersion of the flexural modes. Uh, 
if you if you if you if you just um, uh, spend a uh, moment thinking about it you'll realize that in an isotropic medium the slowness of the dipole flexural modes the dipole flexural waves shows an overlapping so you see here in the right hand panel the first plot on the top left where I am showing the slowness versus frequency. So this is basically a dispersion uh, plot. And in an isotropic medium, the slowness of the flexural waves follow an overlapping pattern behavior in the frequency domain. Whereas in an anisotropic uh, medium, significant differences in slowness would be expected. And also the behavior of the dispersion curves varies based on the nature of the formation anisotropy. In the presence of intrinsic anisotropy, for example, uh, intrinsic can be because of the textural anisotropy, because of the fractures, etc. Dipole flexural waves show separation. So here in the third subplot, you can see the dipole flexural waves, the fast shown by red, the slow shown by the blue, they show a separation everywhere and do not cross cut each other. However, in the right hand side, you see in the presence of stress induced anisotropy, uh, you will see a characteristic crossover between the fast and the slow uh, flexural modes. And uh, 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 the fast and the slow uh, uh, modes travel parallel and perpendicular to the far field uh, horizon, uh, maximum horizontal stress uh, direction in such case. So with this theoretical background, we looked at the data that we obtained in the pilot borehole. And you can see two sets of plots. One on the left shows the uh, uh, dispersion analysis from several depths outside the anomalous zones. And on the right hand side, you can see uh, from the anomalous zones. And you can see that on the right hand side, uh, we, have, we can see the very clear crossover of the two flexural modes. And that indicates that in such zones, in those anomalous zones, the anisotropy could be primarily controlled by stress. Now, if you look at uh, uh, the stress anisotropy analysis in a little more detail, uh, you can see that the anomalous zones, again here, the plots are from 2,100 meters to about, uh, well, these are showing a few uh, segments between the uh, 2100 meter to 3000 meter. For example, the first plot here shows between 2100 to 2275 meters. The second plot here shows between 2675 meters to 2850 meters. And, and you can see very clearly that the anomalous zones, which are shaded again, are characterized by a very high as well as variable. Uh, anisotropy levels and the fast shear azimuth which is plotted here on the right hand side in each plot if you see the fast shear azimuth that shows very strong uh, uh, perturbations uh, which are called rotations that is the change in orientations in such zones such signatures clearly point to tectonically disturbed uh, uh, zones uh, which could be uh, fault zones or fault damage zones so if you look at the right hand plot uh, the plot on the right panel uh, extreme right here we have uh, now one more thing i wanted to tell you is that when the uh, anisotropy is essentially stress induced then the fast shear azimuth is uh, often a quite reliable indicator of the uh, uh, direction of the principal horizontal maximum stress and these directions we plotted here, FSA. So this is from the fast shear wave azimuths, which are plotted in red in this plot in the extreme right. And the SH max orientation, which we measured, I'll talk to you about it, but which we measured in more detail uh, uh, from, the, uh, from the drilling induced tensile fractures, which we identified in the image logs, about which will come later. But you can see the consistency between the two independent data sets. And that shows that the FSA, the fast shear azimuth is uh, uh, in, in this case, quite a reliable indicator of the, of the uh, uh, SH max orientation. 
And you can also see that these orientations are perturbed in these anomalous zones. So essentially it goes like this, but you can see uh, uh, that they deviate uh, from the essentially north south in such zones which are shaded, which are, which are those same anomalous zones that we talked about earlier. OK, so when we looked at these zones in the borehole images, uh, we found a lot of telltale evidences for uh, explaining the anisotropy. We found small aperture fractures, fine grained material, possibly gouge that suggests the presence of a fault zone. We found borehole breakouts. You can see the borehole breakouts here. And these images were obtained by two methods. So the first, uh, there are three sets of images shown here. In each set, the first one is obtained from the formation micro, uh, micro resistivity imager. And the second one is basically an acoustic, acoustic uh, uh, log. And both these uh, give uh, complementary information uh, about the uh, borehole image. So you can look at both and uh, do an integrated study. And so my colleagues did that. I'm showing here, these are the breakouts, for example, in the central panel, very clear breakouts. Then a lot of fractured zone on the right, extreme right, you can see fractured zone primarily showing tensile fractures of varying widths. So these are present all over the borehole. So essentially what we what I want to say is that there is a good consistency between the geophysical logs and the and the borehole images throughout the borehole. OK, now I go to another uh, set of uh, data. Uh, uh, which which came from <clears throat> the formation gases and we were able to measure the formation gases during the drilling. Of this pilot borehole and this was set up. Uh, this lab was set up with the help of uh, ICDP, the International Continental Drilling Program. So uh, we set up this gas lab and we collected these sample gas samples as they came up, as the drilling was in progress. And uh, we also measured them uh, in the in-house in, in laboratory there. Uh, and then the samples were collected and also measured uh, later in, 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 in laboratories outside the drilling site. And uh, here I will not go into too much of detail, but just let me say that helium is really an important helium four particularly is really an important indicator, a geochemical indicator for detection of hidden fault fracture systems, as you can see in this picture. So if you have a fault fracture fault system uh, which is permeable, the helium preferentially uh, helium basically comes up by through degassing of rocks. Uh, and I can talk about it another day, but the preferentially it flows up through these permeable zones. Uh, if, for example, active fault system or a fracture zone and in many other cases also, but I'll not go into detail with uh, from the uh, into those, but I'll just show you the helium uh, measurements that uh, were obtained in this pilot borehole. And you can see here a plot depth on the Y axis again 1500 to 3000 meters. And on the X axis, we have plotted the helium four levels in parts per million. And uh, let me remind you that the atmospheric abundance of helium four is 5.24 parts, parts per million. Anywhere you go, you will find 5.24 parts per million. And you can see in these zones between 2100 to 3000 meters depth, the helium levels reach very anomalous levels, high anomalous high levels of up to 7.8 parts per million above the atmospheric level. And these are again very clearly indicative of the fault fracture zones. And if you recall the geophysical logs and the anisotropy and the rotations, you can very well correlate that this zone between 2100 to 3000 meters uh, are a really uh, fractured and they could be really fault zones or fault damage zones. And this helium, uh, we also measured the isotope ratios and they found, we found that these are basically crustal or atmospheric in origin, so there was no mantle component. So uh, if you look at, uh, if you look at, if you recall the, f uh, the uh, few minutes earlier, I had mentioned that a soil helium study was done in 1967, uh, 1996-97 uh, by NGRI uh, in this 
Kadoli area, which is shown on the extreme right here. You will recall this plot. And we, there we had got, got up to, obtained up to seven parts per million above atmospheric value of helium-4. And if you look at the extreme right figure, which we obtained from the pilot borehole experiment, which was carried out about five kilometers south of the Kadoli area, we find very similar levels of helium enhancement uh, in these zones between 2,100 meters and 3,000 meters. This again uh, led us to believe that, uh, led us to uh, 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 conclude that the Donechi Wada Fisher zone, or at least the pilot borehole, has penetrated the Donechi Wada Fisher zone or its subsidiary uh, faults at depth. So uh, essentially, multiple lines of evidence obtained from the measurements down to three kilometer depth suggests that the Donechi Wada Fisher zone is the surface manifestation of a crustal fault which extends further to the south from Kadoli and is permeable even after 50 years of the 1967 earthquake. So this was a really interesting piece of result. It is still quite active as borne out by the recent seismological data. If you have seen, uh, uh, if you recall the seismological evidences that the seismological data that I had shown earlier towards the start of the talk. So this, this again shows that the Donechi Wada fault is a promising target for further deep drilling and detailed seismic monitoring through time. I will now go to the second part of the talk and address uh, a very important question. Why does Koina experience recurrent seismic activity over such a long time? And uh, for the first time, we, uh, we using a combination of subsurface fracture information, obtained from borehole images with the in-situ stress, uh, we have attempted to understand the occurrence of the recurrent seismic activity in the Koena region through a very different approach. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that, but I also want to mention that this is only one approach. The, there are other things, very important things to be done. For example, uh, advanced laboratory experimentation, long-term monitoring, uh, for which we need deep drilling and setting up of the observatory at depth, where seismology, temperature, pore pressure, possibly strain can be measured, and then integration of these in situ measurements, laboratory studies, and borehole seismology. That so these are the different approaches. But today I'm going to talk about what we have done so far. And we have, as I repeat, that for the first time we tried to explain this uh, recurrent seismicity from a geomechanical perspective. Uh, specifically from subsurface geological information and stress regime. And one of the important things to understand the stress regime uh, directly are well bore failures. Well bore failures are breakouts, borehole breakouts, and the drilling induced tensile fractures. As you know, the borehole, uh, the breakouts, basically the, the, the concentration of the compressive stress is maximum at the azimuth of the horizontal principal stress, minimum minimum principal stress direction. And in the case of the DITFs, the drilling induced tensile fractures, the concentration of tensile stress is maximum at the azimuth of the maximum horizontal principal stress. And therefore, these give us, these two uh, data sets give us a very good hold on the SH min and SH max orientations. And when we did uh, when, when we studied the uh, image logs in the borehole in great detail, we were able to pick up several of these uh, breakouts and breakouts we uh, measured, I, if I remember, from about 232 uh, segments in the borehole and uh, the drilling induced tensile fractures. And when we plot the SH max and SH min orientations here, you can see on this right hand panel in the figure, uh, so it's basically north to north, 0 to 360 degree, and depths ranging from about 1,500 to 3,000 meters depth, that is the granite nice basement. And the black ones are SH max orientation, which we obtained from the DITFs, the SH min orientation from the breakouts. And you can see that the, they are uh, a very good consistent information comes from the two data sets. And when you look at in more detail, in the, in the central panel uh, where I have plotted, uh, where I have also shaded those anomalous zones one to seven on the right hand side, these are the, this is the original geophysical log from where we had identified the 
seven zones of uh, phys anomalous physical and mechanical properties. And you can see that in these anomalous zones, the stress orientations, the stress orientations that we found from the study of the image logs, they show rotations. So they show perturbations from the north-south orientation in these zones. So these zones definitely so number one, we saw that in the fast shear azimuths, we saw the we saw the shear wave anisotropy, high anisotropy in these zones. We saw the rotation of the fast shear azimuths. Now we see rotations of these <coughs> stress orientations from two independent sources, the wellbore breakouts, as well as the drilling induced and cell fractures. And therefore, these zones are really tectonically disturbed zones, and we have identified them as uh, likely fall damage zones. We also carried out uh, uh, the in situ hydrofract tests uh, because we needed the stress magnitudes as well <clears throat> in, uh, in addition to the orientation. <clears throat> and this is also another direct uh, measurement. And it's a very difficult uh, thing to do measurements at such depths. Uh, it, there have been only maybe about uh, 10 or uh, so measurements throughout the world, maybe 12 measurements through crystalline basement rock at such depths of a few kilometers. And so we used a double straddle packer system and we measured the, uh, we isolated zones at eight different depths between 1600 meters and 2400 meters. And we were able to record the pressure time curves and get the information on the stress profiles, the stress magnitude and the orientation. So here you can see the red ones show the SH min, the blue ones show the SH max orientations, and the black solid line is the is the vertical stress profile, uh, SV. And the orientations again, north-south. But very interestingly, if you see the right-hand most panel, uh, where we have compared the orientations from the three different methods, the hydrofracture tests on top in black, in the bore, from the borehole breakouts in red, the rose diagrams, I'm, I'm referring to the rose diagrams on the right, and uh, from the drilling induced tensile fractures at the bottom is shown in blue. And you can see the consistency between the stress orientations um, uh, obtained or estimated from three independent data sets. So it's, this is a very good, uh, I, I would say, hold it gives a very good hold on the stress orientation in the Koina region. Now, another important thing, if you see, if you look at uh, from the faulting environment point of view, if you look at this, uh, the, the data, the SH max data shown in blue, you will see that they are very close, the borderline almost. And uh, although this shows a strike slip environment, but then, very small triggers could actually push this uh, towards a normal faulting environment. And therefore, the transitional faulting environment is now also quite clearly established. We have earlier seen from these observations from the seismological records that both strike slip and normal are possible. And here we see that this is a definite, the, the subsurface geological condition shows that this is a transitional faulting environment. The last thing that we want to uh, do today is to look at the fractures. Do I have five more minutes, Santanu? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Do, I have, yes, sir. Yeah, do I have five more minutes? Please, yes, please carry on. Okay. okay. So the, 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 this is the last thing that I would like to uh, discuss today, are uh, the fractures. Now we have got the stress orientations from uh, different data sets in the borehole. And now we want to look at the fractures from the image logs in the granitic basement. And because we uh, really want to study the orientations of the fractures with the orientations of the stress. And that would uh, give us a lot more information on the faulting environment. So we, what we did was, uh, we, uh, my colleagues uh, identified uh, about 2,226 fractures and plotted the strike and dip. And you can see on this plot, on the extreme left, you have the SH max orientations from the breakouts and the drilling induced tensile fractures. And the strikes 
in these rose diagrams, the strikes are shown here. You can see the red ones. And in most of these segments, the majority of these segments, you can see that these stress orientations in the granitic basement are aligned favorably with the uh, orientation of the uh, principal horizontal, uh, maximum principal horizontal stress. The other thing that you see from the dip of these fractures, the plot of the dip of the fractures in the right hand side, you can see there that most of these fractures are steeply dipping in the range 45 to 675 degrees. Uh, and these two data sets in conjunction with the SH max orientation imply favorable condition for normal to oblique strike slip faulting environment in the Quina region. This is another very important result that we obtained. And if you look at this result and the uh, stress data, uh, so from the, uh, the, 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 the panel on the right hand side here shows uh, the Coulomb frictional failure. Uh, we, we estimated the, we calculated the Coulomb frictional failure from uh, uh, the concept of Jagger and Cook, 1979. And so on the on the on the on the x axis you have the s3 minus the pore pressure pp is the pore pressure on the y, y axis we have s1 uh, minus pore pressure and if you see these plots uh, different plots the dashed curves are for coefficient of friction mu uh, 0 0.2 0 0.61 and we know that uh, 0 0.6 to 1 is the range where uh, it's it's the critical stress level <coughs> Sorry. Now, if you, we plotted the stress data, the, the, the basically we calculated this from the hydrofract data that we measured in the borehole, and we plotted in two conditions. One, assuming a pore pressure of uh, we, we, uh, zero pore pressure, and the other as a hydrostatic case. And if you see, for the hydrostatic case, the blue ones, the blue dots, they plot very clearly in the 0 0.6 to 1 uh, uh, coefficient of friction 0 0.6 to 1 field, which means that the Koena region is critically stressed for the hydraulically conductive fractures. Now, this is a very important result. And we, now we are doing a lot of studies uh, trying to find uh, evidences for these hydraulically conductive fractures in the core samples also. Uh, several um, interesting studies are going on. For example, I'll show you one by Alessio Cesarin and Giulio Di Toro. Uh, so this is, a, uh, this is a thin section from one of the core samples. And you can see that this is the uh, calcite bearing vein here, which is Chris, uh, cut, cutting across the cutting across the uh, rock sample. And here we have, we see a very clear evidence of a chloride patch. So these are hydrous minerals. And uh, the, their presence is, is itself a big evi uh, a solid evidence that these could be hydraulically conductive fractures. And because this is critically stressed region, so small changes in 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 uh, small changes in, for example, pore pressure or the coefficient of friction, uh, could trigger the uh, uh, the failures very frequently, and that is probably one of the ways in which we can explain the triggered earthquakes, the frequent triggered seismicity in the Koina region, because here we have a favorable condition for earthquakes to occur due to presence of optimally oriented, critically stressed, and hydraulically conductive fractures. Now, as I said earlier, this is only the first. Uh, approach. This is only one approach and further constraints on the RTS mechanisms can be obtained from in situ measurements and monitoring at hypocentral depths, a lot of laboratory experimentation and uh, then finally integration uh, with the other uh, integration of all the data sets. So I'll, I'll probably skip this implication and summary I have already concluded almost just like to show some future directions. So we have done these in situ measurements. Now we have to do a lot of laboratory rock mechanical experiments, rock strength, rate and state, frictional properties, false dynamics, permeability measurements, and then combine the in situ measurements and laboratory data 
uh, and try to come up with uh, more uh, with, with, with further explanations about the triggered earthquakes. And then when we have the fault zone observatory, uh, at, uh, ultimately, then we can compare the data sets, lab data and the and the in situ data monitoring uh, data from the fault zone observatory. And uh, uh, that can give us a bet better understanding of the primary controlling factors of the RTS and, and insights into possibly earthquake precursors. So in conclusion, I'd like to uh, mention a very broad conclusion that, but this is extremely important. What I talked was scientific drilling in fault zones, but let me say that the scope of scientific drilling and the applications of borehole geophysics are immense, and they are poised to grow rapidly both as, as both industry and the academia realize its potential to provide cost-effective and direct information on the processes operating at depth. And we are uh, really keenly looking forward to scientifically exciting and new research opportunities that have opened up in the frontier areas that can be addressed through borehole geophysics. I'd like to thank uh, uh, CSIR, NEIST, and uh, the organizing committee, Director Narahari Shastri, for giving me this opportunity to share the results of one of the finest experiments that have that that is being currently conducted in the in the in our country in the domain of solid earth research thank you very much Thank you so much, sir, for such a wonderful and educative lecture on deep drilling and downhole measurements for better understanding of earthquake processes. We hope all our participants are highly benefited from your lecture. Uh, before moving ahead, I would like to announce that we will take three queries from the attendees. Although we have enabled the set box for the question and answer session, it appears that it is not working for many of them. Therefore, may I request the participants with a query to kindly raise their hands and accordingly, we may ask you to unmute yourself to clear your Query. Uh, also, the participant may please send the rest of their unattended questions to the email ID of the convener of this workshop, who will send the questions to the concerned speaker and ask him for his kind response to the queries. And then we will send the responses to your respective email IDs. Further, we would like to mention that these questions that are sent via mail will also be considered by the convener in evaluating and selecting the participants for the award to motivate the young researchers and students for their active involvement in this workshop that was announced at the beginning of this session. Thank you. Uh, today we are fortunate to have amongst us um, Dr. Arun Kumar Gupta, scientist from Ministry of Art Science, uh, Dr. Api Singh, uh, scientist from NCS, National Center for Seismology, uh, um, Dr. Avizit Ghosh from University of California and Dr. G. Surya Narana from um, B.R. Ambedkar University. Um, so now may I request um, Dr. Arun Kumar Gupta sir uh, to say a few words on this talk. Over to Dr. Gupta sir. Hello, sir. Uh, I think he is not there uh, at this moment. Uh, so now may I request uh, Dr. Api Singh, scientist from um, NCS. Uh, so, sir, uh, can you uh, kindly say a few words on this talk? Over to Dr. Api Singh, sir. I think he is also not uh, present at this moment. Uh, so now may I request our honorable session chairperson, Professor Kyle sir, to provide his final remark on this session. Over to Professor Kyle sir. I think uh, I think we are <laughs> bothering everybody on a Sunday morning. <laughs> and uh, maybe very late night in the US. <laughs> Dr. Rai, hearty congratulations. That the amazing experiment and amazing results you have now you know, enlightened us, presented to us. It's incredible. I think we are we will be so proud of you that you are leading this project and you are really uh, great uh, job, I should say. And uh, now, 
apart from this you know, very educative and informative informational data and all things, I have a little query about this about the status of the pilot borehole. I think it is now completed. Yes. The pilot borehole, which was in the three kilometer depth, I yes. think is more or less completed. That yes. of that drilling. Yes. Yes. And uh, deep drilling is uh, is going to be started, or it is. Uh, uh, we are we are we are doing the planning planning. It's in the planning stage. Okay. Now one query, uh, you know, maybe a bit layman question. Between two to three kilometer depth, say, uh, you have got some seven anomalous zones. Now these seven anomalous zones, are they main, main fault zone or the fractured zones, hydro fractured zones? They are they are tectonically disturbed and they could be uh, the fault damage zones. So the fault zones and in the core, if you look at the fault zone, you have a core and then you have the damage zone in the surrounding. So this could be fault damage zones and this could be really associated either with the Donachiwada fault zone or its subsidiary faults. So we don't know, but these are very clearly fault damage zones because uh, you see a lot of stress rotations, a lot of stress perturbations in these zones, both from the first year as a month, as well as from the other uh, stress indicators. So your hydrofracture zones are uh, different from these? Yes, 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 yes. Hydrofract okay. is a completely separate experiment, which is yes. which, which is done to to measure the uh, uh, to measure the stress uh, uh, right. in intact. You you choose intact zones there. Uh, otherwise, you would not be able to. You have to you have to apply water pressure to open the fractures. Yes, I have one more small query uh, that I suppose it is so that in, in this disturbed zone between two to three kilometers, these disturbed zones, is it a very much uh, highly seismogenic? That we are, we are getting a lot of uh, micro seismicity from this zone. I hope so. Uh, uh, well, uh, this uh, definitely the seismicity is spread between two to 10 kilometers. OK, the seismicity is distributed between two to 10 kilometers. So these zones are also uh, having uh, seismicity. Yeah. Now yes. we have set up a five station network, which uh, through uh, in, in the in the in the immediate vicinity of the pilot borehole to 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 uh, constrain the micro earthquake activity even better. And uh, now we are looking at these data. So a lot of micro earthquake activity is in this zone. Yes, but this is not the only zone you have below also. Yeah, 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 yeah. I have no words, Dr. Rai. Amazing information and amazing the data you have shown to us and you have enlightened us. Thank you so much for a wonderful lecture. I think it's beneficial to all of us. Young as well as you know. Uh, oh, old such as everybody okay. we have been thank you to. thank you very thank much you. And, and we and we need all all of your good wishes uh, because so. uh, because what lies ahead is a really big challenging job yes yes it's a challenging job yes yeah. no doubt about that thank you thank you thank you very much thank you very much thank you sir uh, i think uh, we are we are also privileged to have Dr. Obizit Ghos from University of California, USA with us. Now, may I request Dr. Ghos to say a few words on this talk? Over to uh, Dr. Ghos. Sorry, oh, Abhijit. Sorry, oh, Abhijit. I, I kept you uh, awake uh, such up to such late hours. No, no worries. I was glued to the screen. Such a wonderful talk. Very exciting. I'm very proud to see such a fantastic, successful experiment. Uh, that you guys are carrying out in India. This is one of the very few successful deep drilling experiment in the world. So in any standard, this is this is absolutely amazing. I'm, I'm so happy to see that. So thank you, congratulations on that. Um, and thank you for all the hard work that you are doing. Um, I, it's, you know, there's so many interesting things that you can do, but uh, I'm, I'm a seismologist and yes. I, I was wondering whether you have thought about uh, connecting the dots here. And the two dots, the main dots here is 
the rock physics, you have incredible amount of data, very unique data set and seismological data. So we seismologists, we try to get the seismic waves, which is kind of a remote sensing and try to infer this, like, you know, VS, VP, um, fluid, permeability, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. And you yeah. have the yeah. direct measurement there. So yeah. you have a unique opportunity here to compare this inference Absolutely. with the ground truth, Absolutely. which is which is an unique opportunity that yeah. we don't yeah. have often in the world. Um, in addition to that, uh, perhaps with the seismic monitoring, the distribution of earthquake with some advanced technique like machine learning, et cetera, we could map out the fault using seismological data and this um, borehole data and compare them and see um, how they, they compare, like what we see in seismological data that uh, we don't see in borehole and vice versa. Um, there are also interesting aspects of some faults may not be seismic, uh, for example. So you have fault, no doubt about it. But if it is not seismic, is it as seismic? Uh, do we have tremor, uh, low frequency earthquake, things like that? So there are hundreds, hundreds of things uh, we can do. It's, it's very exciting. Um, but I think to me, for future generations to come, uh, scientists, global scientists, uh, of course, Indian, but it has a global impl implications, I think. I think thinking about joining the dot that we do, like seismological inference with ground truth, rock physics data, can be really groundbreaking. And we right. have a, a unique opportunity here in India to lead that front in science. Um, so perhaps we should kind of I, as a I, 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 really, I really cannot agree with you more, Abhijit. Uh, this has been uh, our effort from the beginning. And uh, we are actually trying to establish some laboratories. But uh, rock physics, uh, we, are, uh, we, are trying to, we are trying to get access to certain laboratories where we can do the rock physics uh, part. This is extremely, extremely important. Uh, we had uh, started some time back uh, with the help of uh, one of the uh, renowned scientists in this field. Uh, essentially, we it takes time to set up the laboratories in 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 the country. So right now we have we have definitely gone ahead and set up a borehole geophysics research laboratory. And the next thing to do is to populate this uh, laboratory. So rock physics, both rock physics and rock mechanics. Both are extremely important. And uh, then the structural geology part to combine with the rock mechanics. So rock physics, uh, one of the important things that we want to do is, you know, the seismic anisotropy part, for example. So uh, kind of things that you mentioned. So that, that will be extremely important. And we have the core samples from depth. We have, we have the samples. So if we can do that, it will be really interesting. Uh, and I'm sure we will do that. I'm sure we will do that. Uh, the second uh, part is, uh, uh, I just, I'm missing the second second point that you mentioned. Um, uh, I, I mentioned the seism uh, seismic distribution based on. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, so again, 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 my, my colleagues here, Dr. Anup Sutar uh, and Dr. Sunil Rohila are, uh, are, have started this initiative uh, looking at the uh, data. Uh, we, we have just started getting some new data from the uh, close vicinity of the pilot borehole. So uh, the uh, one of the objectives is to is to is to build is to develop these techniques. I mean, I think uh, there is a lot of work that is already available. Uh, if you look at the work by Beroza and uh, uh, different groups in the United States and other places, they are already available. We are also trying to develop a few tools in order to uh, uh, look at these alignments of seismic seismicity much better, the distribution of seismicity much better. So that that is also that has also been initiated. And the previous thing that rock physics, of course, it has been an ongoing effort. We have not been able to get uh, going so far, but some work has been done by my colleagues, Deep Jyoti Goswami and uh, Vyasulu Kiraju. 
so uh, i hope both these are extremely important and we hope to con- do much better uh, in the future maybe with the help of uh, people like you and others uh, in the community absolutely i'm very happy to help and i look forward to see some more exciting results good luck uh, thank you. for the future effort thank you thank you sir uh, we are also glad to have uh, dr g surya narayana from bir ambedkar university uh, so now may i request uh, dr surya narayana to say a few words on this talk over to dr surya narayana i think uh, is also not there at this moment so now we have a few queries from the audience who have raised their hands uh, now may i request um, sai dinesh m to please unmute yourself and ask your query hello uh, thank you for the opportunity provided to ask this query so uh, i'm interested in knowing that um, as you mentioned there are lots of factors involved in drilling so how do you control uh, there there will be multiple uh, mud losses while drilling so so what type of mud weight uh, did you use so yeah so uh, we uh, uh, most of this drilling was done by air hammer okay so the we did not use uh, the conventional mud uh, it was basically air but in such zones where in such mud loss zones which we faced in the particularly in the uh, basalt and in some at some depths in the basement also so there uh, we had to switch to mud rotary and uh, there we used drilling mud uh, the mud weight was i can't remember the exact uh, numbers but we did not use a very heavy mud we tried to control using using other available techniques so uh, the mud that was used was bentonite a small amount of bentonite but i don't re- really remember the mud weight that we used but it was not a very high mud weight yes sir uh thank you sir uh, with this we would like to end our quick q and a session here as we have in limited time in our schedule so i would like to request all our attendees who have their queries to kindly email it to us and we will forward it to our concerned speaker and send a reply to your respective email id now may i request uh, mr prasujya porthakur who is a junior research fellow at csr nis to kindly deliver the vote of thanks over to mr prasujya uh, thank you mr nabazuti namaskar and good morning to all as today's event has come to an end it is my immense pleasure to convey heartfelt thanks to each and every one on behalf of entire csr nis family and the organizing member of ibw gst 2022 i like to take this opportunity to thank dr sukanta roy sir for accepting our invitation and delivering such an educative talk thank you once again sir for such a wonderful and edifying lecture it was a great pleasure to have you as a keynote speaker for this event Our deep sense of gratitude goes to our honorable director sir Dr G Narahari Shastri ji for his tremendous support and guidance in each and every step of the workshop our heartfelt appreciation to the international advisors professor Andrew J Michael USGS and professor Dabeng Jhao Tohoku University Japan for their thoughtful insight for this live sessions i further take this opportunity to express my profound gratitude to the sessions say a person professor jr kayal former deputy director general gsi government of india and sessions co chair person dr vivit suryanto from ugm indonesia and dr debojit hazarika wadia institute of malayan geology for providing needful guidance i would also like to thank the special guest of today's sessions dr vm tiwari director ngri dr ap singh ncs dr arun kumbuta moes Dr Z Suryanarayan Bihar Ambedkar University and Dr Abhijit Ghosh University of California for their kind presence as part of their busy schedule I like to thank Dr Santanu Borosa the convener of IBWGST 2022 for his devotion towards this international workshop we sincerely thanks him for providing us this amazing platform to listen and interact with such prominent intellectuals around the globe A special thanks goes to the members of technical and organizing committee for their months of hard work and dedication 
Last but not the least, I express my deep sense of appreciation to all the attendees and the active participation in today's event. We, the IVW GST team, wish for continued support throughout the event and look forward to see you all in our next session tomorrow, sharply at 3 p.m. Indian Standard Time. Our keynote speaker for tomorrow's session is Dr. Margarita Segu from British Geological Survey, UK, and she will be delivering talk on the physics of earthquake interactions, recent advances informed by deep learning catalogs. On this note, we are signing off from today's event. Namaskar, Dhanabad. Thank you so much, sir.